Oh, yes! Hello, everybody! Happy New Year! 2024! My goodness, there's already been 2,024 years total. Time flies, I'll tell you what. Anyway, I uh, hope everyone had a really good holiday season. I uh, enjoyed the break, but now it's time for us to get back on that One Piece train. Everybody back on! Come on! Watch for the closing doors. We're pulling out of the station. This year in One Piece, pay attention, because we're going to be going going to Elbath, probably, and then uh, 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 Shanks is going to do some stuff there, maybe, and uh, uh, Buggy, Crocodile, and Mihawk are going to team up with, um, uh, with Law, and they're going to make an even better cross guild with Beppo as the new mascot. All of this and more coming up this year in One Piece. We look to the past as we head for the future. Yeah, yeah, that was poignant and really poetic. Did I just pull that out of my butt? Where did I get? Oh, I no, no. <laughs> you know what that's from? That's from the English dub opening of Digimon Frontier, which, by the way, hot take, I don't know, is the best Digimon season of all. It's the one where they actually turn into the Digimon. It's great. But anyway, yeah, uh, wise words from Digimon Frontier. Uh, you know, it's up there with, like, Shakespeare as, as the greatest literary works of our time. Anyway, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, One Piece. Alright, this will be One Piece, chapter 1104 review, titled, Thank You, Daddy. You know what? Before we even get to the cover spread, and then we get to the chapter, I just have to... I, I want to bring this up really quick, because it's something I have noticed, right? These are the titles of the last few chapters of One Piece, okay? So this one was, Thank You, Daddy. Then, last time, we had, uh, I'm Sorry, Daddy. And then before that, we had Kuma's Life. And then before that, we had Two Bonnie. And then before that, we had Thank You, Bonnie. I'm just, I'm just noticing it, reviewing it every week. Uh, well, I know we just got done with a break, but reviewing it every week, I'm just like, well, a lot of these chapter titles are kind of like vaguely similar, like, you know, but it makes sense because they are like letters and, you know, stuff written between Bonnie and Kuma, like from that perspective. But I just wanted to address that. All right, so the cover page is actually really adorable. It's uh, Sanji in a restaurant and there's two mice and one of the mi one of the mice is proposing to another mouse and uh, it looks like she accepts so that's fantastic and Sanji is there with a wedding cake and I think the cake is like modeled after the cake he made for Big Mom so not a wedding cake I guess an engagement cake is that a thing well it is now so Sanji's like ah congratulations Mr. Mouse and Mrs. Mouse here's your cake you know it's like from the hit movie Ratatouille it's been a while since I've seen Ratatouille. I remember the mouse's name was Remy. Did, did the mouse have a love interest in that movie? I remember the guy did. There was like a love interest there. But I, I don't remember if like the mouse, if the rat had, if, if Remy had a, had a love interest and at one point he, you know, proposed to, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. There needs to be a sequel to Ratatouille and that's what they need to do. Okay, but anyway, that's, that's fantastic. Very, very cute cover page. Alright, so we move on from the cute cover page to Kuma bringing the pain! Yeah! And it's great because we literally have the scene right from the last chapter where, you know, Kuma shows up, protects Bonnie, takes his hockeyed up fist, which apparently he can still do even though he's a robot, and he charges that up and he goes right for Saturn, right? And it's, it's almost like time dilates. It's like the scene in One Punch Man where Genos and Saitama are sparring and then Genos is like, give me your strongest punch, and then like time slows down as Genos like sees the giant death Death punch, and then you just have the kanji for death, like she over it, like boom, you know, it's kind of like that, right? Where Saturn is there and he's just like, mmm. And, and he, like, this is the last thing that anybody was expecting. This was the last thing that Vegapunk expected, Bonnie expected, Saturn expected, and we even get some uh, perspective from Vegapunk here in a little bit, where he's like, even, like, I don't even know how this is happening, and I'm a scientist, right? So, you have a shot where Saturn is just staring at Kuma, just like, hmm, and then you have a flashback. Now, I originally thought the flashback was from the perspective of Saturn, uh, because it begins with Kuma being a little kid on God Valley as he met with Saturn, you know, like 38 years ago. 
where Saturn is like, you are a buccaneer. You can either live as a slave or you die. Such is the uh, fate of those of your ilk. You know, so I thought it was from like, you know, like Kuma lands and then that, you know, reminds Saturn of the last time he saw him, you know, at God Valley as, as a kid. And that was the perspective. But no, we get the flashback from Kuma's perspective. So I don't know if this is just to remind the audience of like, hey, remember all that messed up stuff that happened to Kuma? Just just wanted to throw that at you one more time as Saturn just gets punched in the face at like Mach 6, you know? It's gonna be fantastic, okay? Or another way you could interpret this is that Kuma, he still does have some of his personality, some of his will, some of his memories in there, and like maybe it's very distorted, but like this is flashing in front of him as he's like going to punch Saturn, you know? It's like he sees a flash of his dad all covered in blood and telling him, you know, he's like, oh, uh, you're mother's gone, but she's in a better place now, and then has a flash of Ginny, and then a flash of the Den Den Mushi as Ginny says her final goodbye to Kuma, and then Kuma at the church with baby Bonnie, so I imagine that Kuma is seeing all this in his, like, database or whatever, it's just, like, very staticky and just, as he's just, like, you know, terminate, exterminate, you know, so... Uh, Bonnie is there, she's crying, and it, it's so crazy because, like, Kuma is still, like, we have a shot of Saturn who's like, Vegapunk, what is the meaning of this? How is Kuma still alive? I activated his self-destruct mechanism days ago. How is he still moving? And Saturn still manages to get all of that out as Kuma is still, <laughs> he's like, still like, Rah! Vegapunk, what's the meaning of this? I activated his self-destruct mechanism days ago. How could he be? Boom! <laughs> and that's when the punch finally connects. So a little bit of cinematic timing there. Um, now, this does bring up something really important, though. It's like, okay, we talked about Vegapunk installing an explosive into Kuma. And so I immediately went to, like, the Hunter Hunter, Isaac Netero, you know, poor man's rose bomb, you know, where Kuma's gonna grab onto Saturn and then detonate. So we're gonna find out that that's actually not the type of bomb he placed in Kuma. He actually didn't place a bomb at all. Uh, but we, that'll make sense in a moment. But one thing that was like a big deal was like, well, wait a minute. If Kuma had this self-destruct mechanism inside of him, why wouldn't they have activated that already? Like, Kuma was taken by the Revolutionary Army from Marijua, so you would assume that, like, the moment that Kuma was taken out of Marijua and, and was, like, away with the Revolutionaries, that would be the moment where if there was any kind of bomb or self-destruct mechanism in Kuma, that's the moment they would have activated it, right? Where Kuma would have been at Kamabaka or something like that. And, you know, best case scenario, you also take out a bunch of the Revolutionaries. Vegapunk's going to explain the exact nature of the mechanism, but Saturn really did think it was a bomb. And, and so he was just like, what's the meaning of this, Vegapunk? As soon as Kuma left Marijua, I activated the self-destruct. How is he still here? You know? Uh, also the idea that, like, while he was, like, uh, invading Marijua the second time and storming through there and fighting Akainu and everything like that, um, you, you'd think that it would have been activated then if it had any ability. So, um, it was activated. Saturn did trigger it. It's not not a bomb, but it is a type of kill switch that was designed to like terminate all of his life functions. All right, it was like the permanent off button, okay, that was going to destroy his circuitry, so not the big kind of kaboom. But even so, whether or not it was a bomb or not, it didn't activate when triggered, okay, so that's important. Oh, by the way, so a couple of people have mentioned this, and I had to go back and look into it. So when Kuma was fighting a Kainu at Marijua, he really got messed up. Like, Part of his face was burned off, and I believe, I don't know if it was both of his legs, but one of his legs definitely got melted by Akainu's magma as he, I, I, the way I seem to be remembering it was like he was in the lava and then he rocketed away, and then, you know, he landed here, and Kuma now has both of his legs back and his face does not seem as burned as it was when he fought against uh, Akainu. I, I have a feeling that's just an error on Oda's part. Um, I don't see any mechanism on how he could, like, get his legs back while he was traveling. Because he went from, like, Marijua straight to here. Unless, you know, uh, he stopped at some point to, like, patch up his body. But I don't know if he would have done that. I feel like he was heading straight here out of, like, parental instinct, you know? Um, but anyway, so... Um, Saturn is confused, everybody's confused, Vegapunk, Sanji, Frankie are confused, but we just have this awesome one panel where Kuma is just 
and then double page spread where you see the fist finally entering Saturn's face like Ugh. now there is a shot where it's not the same thing that happens with Charlos, although it is reminiscent of that. By the way, I would love, now that we've done this with Saturn, can we just have a scene, a double page spread of every member of the Gorosei getting punched in the face? That would be fantastic. Those are goals for the end of One Piece. I don't care what the One Piece is. I don't care what the Void Century is all about. All I care is that every single one of the Goro say, keep in mind, this is just Saturn. All that stuff about Kuma's backstory and how messed up Saturn was, that was one of the Goro say. Oda has to now top it. Maybe Saturn was the best out of the Goro say. Maybe he was the nicest one. So every other Goro say we're going to learn about, oh, wait, wait till we get to Marcus Mars. Wait till we get to Top Man. Oh, Top Man is the most messed up out of all of them. And then Eam is even more messed up out of all of them. So you got like five other characters that Oda's like, oh, if you thought Saturn was jacked up, get ready. And then every single time we learn about a horrible thing that one of the Goro say has done to a character that we love, can they just get punched in the face really hard or, or slashed up or hit with a cannon or something? That would be nice, right? Anyway, so Saturn, though, as he's getting punched in the face, as his face is going like concave, uh, he does kind of like open his eyes and he's kind of like, mm, he kind of like steals himself a little bit, but it's not going to stop the, 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 the force of this punch, right? This is the punch of fate. This is the punch of everything you've taken away from Kuma and Ginny and, and Bonnie. This is the punch of a, of a a happy family that has been torn asunder, you son of a bitch! You know, it's going for it, right? So, Kuma hits him, and he goes down and goes flying across the pavement. Like, he hits the ground, like the street, and then proceeds to, like, skid all the way on the concrete, like, rah, like, into a series of buildings on Egghead that all fall down at once, like three big-ass buildings just... Rah, psh, 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 psh all land on top of Saturn, and uh, he's bleeding, he got an arm blown off, one of his uh, spider legs got blown off, oh man, that was nice. It's, as we're gonna see at the end of the chapter, it's not gonna matter much, because Saturn can heal, we already knew that, but man, was that cathartic, okay. So, Saturn, oh, one of his horns got snapped off, oh my goodness, like the whole town itself, like, collapsed on the guy. And so all the Marines that are there are like, what, what, what just happened? Now these are the Marines that aren't uh, Vice Admiral class, so they're kind of like hanging out on the outskirts. So all they see is like a big explosion in the difference, like in the distance, like, oh, what's going on there? Can, can we go check that out or are we still not allowed to go look into it? Then we cut to the Vice Admirals and the Rear Admirals that are watching the battle and they're just like, he, a slave just punched one of the Gorosei? This is unprecedented! Somebody help Saint Saturn! Oh my goodness! I don't think this has like ever happened. Like the Gorosei hardly ever leave their rooms. I don't think this is, like, this is an unprecedented moment. You know, like, the, the Celestial Dragon hit-and-run incident when Luffy punched Charlos, I mean, that was bad enough, but from the perspective, like, they are, they are, like, just, like, like, their jaws are, like, hitting the ground of, like, oh my god, what? Huh? This can't happen! Because Saturn has now been sent flying off into the town and is buried under, like, several tons of rubble, um, Frankie, Sanji, Vegapunk, they can all move again. It probably has something to do with either being directly within Saturn's presence or his vision. I, I think it's more of the presence, because I don't think Saturn was keeping eye contact with all of them at once, because he was, like, focused on Bonnie for a little while there. So I think it's like whenever, like, he sees you and, like, locks you up and then you're in his perimeter, you're stuck, okay, with whatever power he has. Uh, but he doesn't have to keep on direct, you know, vision, like, seeing you, like, directly. Um, but then once he gets knocked away, once you're out of his area of effect, then you can move again, all right? So, uh, you know, obviously, Sanji, Frankie, Atlas, they all get up and they immediately start running over to Kuma and Bonnie. And like, Bonnie, are you okay? Are you okay? Oh my goodness, Kuma's here. Okay, this is insane. Vegapunk is stunned. He's still not moving. Vegapunk can move now, but he's just like, this, this doesn't make any sense, Quasar. I, I couldn't install a bomb inside of Kuma. I just couldn't do it because I knew they would use him as a weapon. Because Vegapunk is like, 
okay. If I install, like, and you know Vegapunk could have installed, like, an A-bomb inside Akuma, no problem. That could have been a very high-yield, like, nuclear explosion, right? But he's like, if I install that inside of him, they're just gonna turn him into a, like, they'll send him at uh, some nation and just detonate him, and then not only would Kuma be destroyed, but also an entire nation. So, so Vegapunk's like, I just, I couldn't, I didn't have it in me to install an actual bomb into Kuma, but I did install a form of self-destruct, like a kill switch, okay? Anybody that knows about computer programming and, and, you know, I don't know, you could probably let me know about this, but I'm going to assume it would probably be feasible to install something like that where if you push a button, maybe a circuit gets fried somewhere or there's something inside of the computer itself that like ruptures in like a chemical or something. There's like a tube. You push a button and the tube shatters and it's a chemical that like destroys all of the machinery and everything inside of a computer and basically just, it's like a kill switch, right? Something like that. Um, so not as not as uh, like uh, Isaac Netero as I thought it was going to be. Like Kuma's just like you have been terminated, Saturn. <laughs> Boom, you know something like that. But it's just like it was supposed to be a button, and then obviously all of Kuma's like functions would cease, and he would just be a vegetable, as as Vegapunk says. However, he's still surprised that like wait a minute, he activated it, and it should have shut the body down completely, and yet it didn't happen. Kuma is still here, which means that the command didn't work. And Vegapunk knows that he programmed it right. He's thinking to himself here, like, I programmed that into Kuma. There, there should be no way that wouldn't happen. You press a button and his circuits shut down. Like, that's the way it should be. So now... I made a video about this earlier in the week where I was talking about like, you know, how did, how did Kuma arrive here? Because there was a lot of theories revolving around like the necklace and like, oh, maybe the necklace was a homing device or maybe Vegapunk programmed some of his personality into Kuma or like, oh, come to save Bonnie or whatever. But no, the, the ultimate realization I had is like, what if all of that was a red herring and the overall message that Oda is trying to convey here is that uh, true love or will or parental instinct can never be overridden by any form of science. And even Vegapunk says like, this might be like beyond science, okay? You know, the idea that the parental protection instinct that Kuma has um, for his daughter is stronger to override any command hierarchy or self-destruct mechanism or or anything, you know, so Vegapunk's kind of coming to terms with that like hmm Okay, Quasar, it seems like true love can override science. That's that's good to know. Make a note of that. And that ties back to, honestly, just the episode we just had in the anime where we had the robotic shark and Lilith comes out of Vega Force 1 and she's like, no matter how much, uh, you know, cybernetics we add to these sea beasts, uh, they will still have a will of their own from the time, like a raw instinct, a primal instinct from before we converted them, you know? Vegapunk even brings up here something about the Buccaneers. He says, you know, so the Buccaneers were mentioned to have many special characteristics beyond just their strength. You know, the fact that they're really big and they had giant blood and they're really strong. We already knew all of that. But Vegapunk was like, there's another aspect about the Buccaneers that has yet to be mentioned. And he trails off so we don't actually know about it. But what if it had something with a willpower? You know, something like, after all, your people once dot dot dot. That might be referring to, to Joy Boy. It might be referring to like, Joy Boy was a Buccaneer, so Joy Boy once, you know, fought against the world government and maybe the the trait of the buccaneers is they have the indomitable will and that will is something that can never be shattered or broken or manipulated so joy boy had it and now this is even before joy boy it's not like joy boy like this could be the will of d like right here this could be this um joy boy didn't start it but like every member of the buccaneer race had this will that can never be broken joy boy kind of just exemplified it when he fought against the world government and that's kind of what became the will of d at that point onward right so kuma has it as well maybe it's something like that so anyway um yeah saturn got sent flying uh we have kizaru who's beginning to move again and he's like oh boy it's over now, isn't it? And so he's getting up. Sentamaro is still tied up, but he's like, Ah, Kuma, you're finally here. Good. Uh, we have some of the other Marines going around like, What did we just watch? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, guys, weren't you supposed to tie up Straw Hat Luffy? Where's he at? Oh, yeah, uh, we tried to do that, but uh, we couldn't find him. What? Yeah, he was eating food over there, so we went to go and put some sea prism on him, and he was just gone. Okay. 
I mean, with everything else going on right now, that honestly doesn't surprise me that much. We just had a giant robot show up out of nowhere and punch one of the Garosei, who, by the way, turned out to be a giant spider. I didn't, I, I, I was not ready for this. These Marines were not ready when they woke up this morning for this. You know, when they were eating breakfast this morning, oh, oh steak and eggs, you know, we're going to be going to Egghead today. We're going to have a big battle. They, they were not expecting this, right? So, uh, the thing with Luffy, really quick, I don't think it was uh, Kizaru that fed him. Um, I'm thinking it's, I'm, I'm going to go with the caribou idea. Caribou was probably the one that gave the food to Luffy, because if Luffy just vanished out of thin air, um, I mean, I guess there is technology on Egghead that can, like, render you invisible, so something like that. Or maybe Sanji busted out the, uh, the stealth black, the upgraded stealth black suit. Um, it would make more sense if Caribou was the one that, like, gave Luffy a bunch of food and then, like, <laughs> sucked him into his swamp. I, I know, disgusting, but it would work, you know, because he can store living things in his swamp. So Caribou could have been like, ah, yes. Now, Caribou works for somebody, and we don't know exactly who that person is. The idea was Blackbeard for a while, and it could be that. Maybe, like, Black, uh, Blackbeard needs this uh, straw hat kid. I'm not going to let him die to the Marines. And like, no. Or it could be Morgans. You could see Caribou working with Morgans. You could see him leaking information to big news, okay? In which case, Morgans might be like, uh, make sure that Straw Hat doesn't die, Caribou. He's got plenty more big stories. Uh, front page news is from Straw Hat. They'll be now to the end of the end of the century and be like okay you know and then he steals uh, actually you know that would actually work out if caribou like stole luffy stole him just took him and then went up to like maybe morgan's his vessel is somewhere around the island and maybe they were able to get on it and then like vivi and wapple would be tied into everything that could happen too um at any rate we have Bonnie now, so Kuma, like, picks up Bonnie, and they're, like, hugging, and Kuma still doesn't, like, he's not saying anything to her. He's still a robot. It's not like, hello, Bonnie, I have been programmed to be your father. You know, it's, it's nothing like that, but Bonnie is back in her child form, and she's hugging her dad. It's like, I saw your memories. M Mommy was such a great person, because Bonnie had no idea about Ginny and her story, and he's like, oh, I saw all the letters you wrote to me. They made me really happy. I don't care if everyone calls you a tyrant, because you're the kindest dad in the world. You're the coolest person. I'll never forget that. And Kuma, like, he's not, Kuma's not crying. His face doesn't change at all he just like and just hugs his daughter and that's it okay and so at that point though we now have as kuma's hugging bonnie all of the buildings behind them that saturn got knocked into are just like boom they all get knocked back and then saturn is right back in front of kuma again stomping towards them with his spider legs and he's just like vega punk I think you have an explanation for this. And like, as he's walking, his spider leg is like reconstituting himself. His arm just, like we see his arm just, just form back into an arm, you know, just like out of the fog or whatever around him, it just reforms. It, it, it's very important. It, it doesn't like, it's not like, um, it's not like the way Piccolo or Cell regenerates from like Dragon Ball, where it's like, ah! you know, it's nothing like that. It literally looks like there's this miasma or fog or like lightning or something around Saturn that just kind of like forms his hand back into, I mean, forms his arm back into itself. Like, like his arm begins to reform at different points. Like it's not coming out of his body. It's just reforming around him. Okay. It's, it's something that I, I mean, it's, it's something to do obviously with the, uh, either a mythical zone or the powers beyond a mythical zone. Like he's an actual demon, you know, that a mythical zone was based on or something. I don't know. Um, but still, Hey, we're learning some stuff about Saturn today. All right. Some things we've learned. Uh, Saturn's actual body is just as squishy as everybody else's. Like, Bonnie was able to stab him with a katana, uh, and Kuma was able to punch him so hard it broke off an arm and several limbs, okay? So, like, if you shoot Saturn or stab him, it, it'll still go in, it'll still bleed, it's just the wound will heal. So, with that being said, we're on Egghead, let's science the shit out of this, why not? So, I'm gonna say, like, all right, I mean, like, I'm obviously you don't have time to, like, measure things and stuff because, you know, you're in the middle of a battle. But I would argue, okay, Kuma punched him, and let's say it took, I don't know, two minutes for him to get back up and then heal and then be like, you know, I'm back now. Well, punch him again and see if it takes the same amount of time. 
And then if it does, punch him again. And like, like let's say Kuma punched him ten times. Would he heal the same time every single time? Or would it take longer? Because if it takes longer, that means he's using up some kind of energy. Like, the first time he heals, it takes two minutes. The second time he gets punched, it takes three. The, you know, seventh time, it takes like several, like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to heal. That means that he's burning through some kind of energy every time. Try attacking him from two different angles. Does he heal the same speed if he gets attacked from both sides? There, there's some sciency shit you can do with this, but you don't really have time to like test it out, right? Can we get Senku on this? Senku would show up and be like, all right. Get excited. So suruze kore wa. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> like, that would be cool, right? Let's get Senku and Vegapunk working together. They could take down Saturn. I think I think that's a low diff at that point. <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, Vegapunk does answer him. He's like, Vegapunk, what's the meaning of this? And Vegapunk's like, I guess it's just fair to say that love is the ultimate science. <laughs> love is the thing that breaks all science. And then you just have Saturn there as he's regrowing a limb and he's just like, ah, I see. You know, how it, it, to err is to human. How short-sighted of me. Uh, humans always mess it up all the time. So he's always referring to himself as not human. So I'm wondering if like he used to be human like hundreds of years ago and he's just given up his humanity or he was never human to begin with. You know what I mean? Like that's a question, right? So Sanji's there, and he's the one that does a little bit of the commentary. He's like, his body is regenerating! You know, that's great, Sanji. Yeah, we already knew that, Sanji. How about you Ifrit Jambe him in the face and see how long... Let's, let's test it with burn damage. We already know what happens when you stab him. We know what happens when you punch him really hard. Set him on fire. Electrocute him. Do, do some different types of damage. Maybe it takes longer for him to heal burns. We need to test this, Sanji. Get moving, all right? Okay? We need to figure out how to kill these guys, okay? So, anyway, Saturn is like, ah, yes, well, you are humans. You, of course, were going to disappoint me. It was foolish of me to ever trust into you. Anyway, let's wrap this up. So he takes his spider leg to go stab Kuma again. Uh, this time, Sanji does get involved. He, his hair actually goes up a little bit, like he activated his raid suit. He didn't, but it's like the passion or whatever. And he charges in, and Sanji kicks um, Saturn's spider leg, and it just... Boop. It just knocks it off course a little bit so it doesn't hit Kuma. So Sanji gets a hit in, and then boom, we have Frankie jumping in. Frankie's like, you know what? When am I ever going to get a chance to fire a radical beam through one of the rulers of the entire world? Frankie radical beam! Can we get Frankie up to a billion or something? He shot a laser through one of the Garose! Once again, their bo his body is not like, it's not like he's made of like super thick stuff. Or his skin is like Superman or something where the laser just boom! Just like bounces off of him or something, right? No, the laser, as with a normal human, if they got shot with the radical beam, goes right through him. Um, so it just blorps right through him. Kizaru shows up right behind Frankie, and uh, you know you know how I went on that long thing last time about how you know Kizaru has a choice to make, and you know after getting back up, is he going to be like, all right, the rulers of the world are apparently demon gods. All right, I can either choose to you know fight with the demons, or you know you're either with the devil or you're against it or whatever. And uh, it seems like Kizaru has made his choice. It's not the choice I would have wanted him to make, but it's a choice he did make. So Kizaru gets up and attacks Frankie. Uh, he says, like, oh, you've all gotten so much stronger since the last time I've seen you. Let's put that growth to the test, shall we? So he goes to kick Frankie, and I think he hits him. Yeah, he hits him pretty hard, and he goes flying. So Frankie gets knocked into a building, and I think the building collapses on him. We don't see Frankie for the rest of this chapter. Don't worry. He'll be fine, guys. He's Cyborg Frankie. He'll get right back up, and he'll be like, all right. Time to show off my true power. And then Frankie regenerates. And it's like, Frankie, you were a Gorosei the whole time? Yeah, but I'm a good Gorosei. It's like, what? Okay, I'll write that down for my 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 Frankie, my Frankie themed. I'm, I'm gonna tell the entire story of One Piece from Frankie's perspective. So let's do that. Right, anyway, so Kizaru light speed kicks Frankie into a building. Uh, meanwhile, Saturn's uh, wound from the radical beam just you know begins to glorp up. 
And then we have the last scene of the chapter, the last double page spread. Bonnie here who's like, Vegapunk, you need to help get my dad out of here. He can't move. I don't think this has anything to do with Saturn's ability because when, you know, when Kuma first landed, he could still move and Saturn's ability to freeze everything apparently didn't work. Maybe Saturn was too surprised or what. Uh, but at any rate, he can't move now. So Atlas picks up Kuma and is just like, we got to get out of here. Go to the lab, the lab phase, the labo stratum and we'll, we'll evacuate. We'll get out of here. So Atlas picks up Kuma starts running, Vegapunk starts running, and Kizaru's there, and it's just like in front of Saturn. So Kizaru seems to have made up his mind here, unless it's all a ploy, which that's a thing in One Piece where every time something happens, there's always like, well, maybe he's pretending. Maybe Kizaru's playing the long game here. It's like, look, as, uh, as doing what I do, you know, with the reviews and everything, I have to consider every possibility. So I guess it's not completely impossible that Kizaru might be like, all right, I am going to betray the world government, but I can't just get up and attack Saturn. That would be too easy. Hmm. All right, I'll pretend to be on their side, and then right when they need me the most, that's when I'll change. Maybe, but I'm not holding out water for that one right now. Kizaru gets up in front of Saturn, and it's just like, well, now that Kuma has joined us, Saturn, maybe there's a few too many uh, game pieces on the board. I think it's time we wrap this up. And Vegapunk is just there, and he's just like, You're a sad man, Kizaru Quasar. No! No Quasars for you. No galaxies or observable universes or Laniakea superclusters for you, Kizaru. You have no heart! And then Kizaru's just, he takes his shades, and he's like, I should have brought a darker pair of shades. I'm gonna embarrass myself at this rate. And then finally, we have the last page of the chapter, where Saturn initiates the Buster Call Protocol. Buster Call has been authorized by authority of the world government. This island is declared a threat to the entire world. A traitor who has studied the taboo secrets of the Void Century, the survivor of a bloodline that should be extinct in the Buccaneers, and a pirate that has awakened the power of God. This island has become completely infested. Burn it to the ground! End of chapter, no break next week. Remember, like, a normal Buster Call, I can't remember how many ships it was, um, but this is like a hundred, okay? This is way more than an ordinary Buster Call. I think a normal Buster Call is like 10 or 20 ships. This is several orders of magnitude bigger than that, all right? So this is gonna be even more devastating than O'Hara, more devastating than Annie's Lobby, okay? Is Kizaru really on the side of the government, or is he gonna be like, actually, I was not this entire time. I was just pretending, you know? Um, I, I would say, I, I'm, I'm going with the idea that he's picked a side. You know, he's picked a side. With Luffy, I feel like Luffy has been taken by Caribou uh, to another location, maybe to see Morgans, or maybe he's working on behalf of Blackbeard. Um, Kuma, you know, like the true love and the parental instinct and everything was able to override most of the circuitry. He still doesn't have, like, his memories, though. He still can't be like, Bonnie, I missed you. It can't be anything like that, but he still is able to fight, at least. Uh, well, maybe not, because he seemed to have locked up. Like, that last punch, like, locked up his servos or whatever, you know, or, so he can't really move. But hey, Sanji, Sanji kicked a spider leg and Frankie fired a laser beam. I'm saying Frankie got the MVP of this chapter beyond Kuma. Kuma obviously had it, you know, from everything, but but Frankie's got a good silver medal here. He's got a good number two, all right? Frankie takes a number two, and I would dare you to dispute that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, yeah, um, we understand a couple more things about Saturn. We know that he can take damage, and he does bleed, um, but he just heals immediately. It doesn't heal, like, out of his body. We know that, like, when he loses an arm, like, if he were to lose a head, like, if Kuma were to just punch him, I mean, Kuma did punch him straight in the face. If his head were to just get blown off, um, maybe the head would just, like just like swirl like the, the the gas or the electricity around him or the smoke would just swirl around his neck and then his head would just reform or something like that so there's definitely some kind of magic going on here but um everything has an upper limit you know what i mean yeah but uh yeah that's the chapter uh no break so we'll have one another one next week getting back into the schedule of things um thanks for watching everybody and now we're getting into a buster call so you know, I actually, with everything happening, the Buster Call is kind of like the, 
Oh, okay, we're doing a buster call, too. I mean, with everything, I mean, Saturn is here, Kizaru is here. I, I guess throw a buster call on top of that as well. Right, okay. Um, but, yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching 101 signing out. Welcome to the new year.